toward arguing for a thesis which, uh, well, presenting a thesis which I don't think can really be argued for in a certain respect. Uh, I'm hoping its truth can be indicated by means of certain argumentative frameworks. And this is, so you want to, is that ready to go? Uh, yes, I'll, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, I'll. Um, there's argumentative frameworks and uh, the thesis is familiar to those of you who work in ancient philosophy because its uh, its rejection is a version of its rejection is famously articulated by Aristotle, and it's a thesis which has come back and forth in the entire history of philosophy. And some cousin of the uh, Aristotelian view, which I myself uh, reject, has made a comeback in the last decade or so, and so it. I thought it might behoove us to take a look at this thesis, and there are um, various ways of formulating it, but I'm going to be arguing or indicating the truth of, or something like that, this thesis, uh, which, I, which I call seamless being, namely uh, the univocity of being. And I'm gonna spend a little bit of time at the beginning of my presentation trying to characterize the thesis because it's not exactly, uh, easy to characterize it. And so very often I find people who are engaged in this debate arguing past each other. And as a kind of coda to my presentation, I'm going to make the claim that many, many people who reject the university of being embrace two theses, which each, each of which would be sufficient for its rejection, I think, but they're actually positively inconsistent with one another. And so I wanna suggest that you can have one or the other, but not both. That's not my main, and that's not the main purport of my talk, however. It's rather to take a look at, um, and I'm thinking, Clouse well, said, you know, this is supposed to be a fundamental affair. So it's about as fundamental as I get. I'm trying to look at strategies for arguing or for characterizing or for defending, and even just for articulating the doctrine of the university of being. Okay, so this is gonna go now here. Yes. Ah, good. No. Uh, so, so I want to say three ways of stating my thesis um, or my claim, and the first is a positive way. It's just that being is univocal. What does that mean? Either it means that as definable, being admits of a single non-disjunctive essence-specifying account. Think of water. Yeah, <laughs> water is H two O. It's not H two O or H three O or something else. Uh, so there are some people who don't think that's a definition. Let it be so. So that's a definition, and it's a single, non-disjunctive, essence-specifying account. So being would be like that. There'd be being is something, like H2O. Another way of stating it is that, as simple, it admits of no essence-specifying account at all. It's really indefinable. Where offering an account requires more than mere extension. It's not just pointing at the thing, saying, you know that. And trivially, though, if it doesn't admit of a, an account at all, uh, it uh, it does not admit of more than a single non-disjunctive essence-specifying account. So we might just put it negatively, and many people do, being is not equivocal. I'm just going to say the same thing from the other side now. Uh, it does not admit of more, so it doesn't admit of more than one essence-specifying account. Again, this might be due to the fact that being is one way or another, uh, has a single, like water, single non-disjunctive essence specifying account, or is indefinable. So for those of you who know medieval philosophy, think of what Thomas Aquinas will say about actuality. He'll say this is a basic non-definable primitive. We doesn't mean we can't talk about it, doesn't mean we can't characterize it, doesn't mean we can't understand it, doesn't mean we can't be acquainted with it. Uh, what it does mean is that we can't give it a definition. Uh, and so the idea would be, well, we can characterize it, we can deploy it, we can see how it interacts with other concepts and then come to get its contours, but that's different than getting, it's like a maybe can be explicated in a various way, but that's different than giving it a definition. Um, put uh, maybe slightly more colorfully uh, in the tag, being is seamless. Being is what is captured by the one and only existential quantifier. Okay, that's the thought. And there is one and only one existential quantifier. One way to get clear about the thesis is to put it contrastively, and this is what I did in my the blurb, which I sent to, to Clouse. Uh, here's two off-held theses, which I'm going to maintain are false. Ontological pluralism, 
And ontological, now things get difficult to say what this thesis is. Uh, those of you who know contemporary metaphysics will know that some versions of ontological pluralism have been articulated and defended with great vigor and intelligence and philosophical acumen by Chris McDaniel in his book, The Fragmentation of Being. Um, that there's now more than one kind of being or more than one way of being. I'm going to capitalize on both of these different ways of formulating the thesis. Um, Arrayed beneath the existential quantifier, the existent X are various domain specific quantifiers. It's probably hard to see up there, but so still, oh yeah, it didn't come through very well in the translation. But anyway, so there exists some X domain one, domain two, domain N, um, which are, and here's the kind of lingo that the proponents of this thesis tend to rely upon, in some way are more natural. They carve the world in natural places. And, and so, the, so it's not just that there are predicates that are more are natural ways of carving the world. There are quant the quantifiers themselves. So you take that thesis and of naturalness and you apply it to the quantifier and say existing. And in some ways, you can, I can sort of see what they're on about abstractly or concretely or something like that. And that's a natural way of carving the world, but it's the predicate which is the thing. So it's not just the objects. So the predicate being abstract, it's the quantifier itself. Now. Um, we might think of the members of such domains as there exists an X domain one through domain two through N as exhibiting or realizing or manifesting different kinds of being. And uh, just notice each time I say being, I'm not saying beings, and I'm gonna make a little fuss about that, uh, or perhaps as existing in different ways. The second thesis, so that's the first thesis I'm opposed to. The second thesis I'm opposed to is ontological scalarity. This is beloved of many theists, but not only theists, certainly known in Neoplatonism. And according to me, it's a presupposition of much contemporary metaphysics. I wrote a paper called The Great Chain of Being Inversion, which is really the view that what used to be the ends perfectissimum is now a bunch of little stuff and it uh, exists more than, uh, so the, the thesis of scalarity is that some things exist more than other things. Uh, one being B1 can exist more than another B2. And I'm just going to use, I know that, that being and ex is and being and exists interchangeably. There is a lot of literature, so people want to draw distinctions and so forth. We're just going to paper over that for today. And even if, you, if you're a Minongian, you can take me to task later, but I'm just going to help myself to it for now. I don't, I don't think there's any, any sense in drawing those distinctions anyhow. So that's to say that the following sentence is syntactically correct, meaningful, and in fact, for some values of X and Y, true, X is more than Y. Now it sounds hard to me, but there are people who say, you know, for example, well, God is more or exists more or more fully or more <laughs> than other things. Um, those wanting to ask, I mean, those me want to say is more what than why need not apply. The sentence is done. This isn't, now just to be careful, because there's a lot of, there's a bunch of little theses that get confused here. Is more powerful, has greater causal oomph, has more autonomy, has more simplicity. I mean, there's a lot of things that you might want to say, and I'm going to be on, on side then, and we can talk about it. But it's just the scalarity of being itself that strikes me as hard to understand. Now, I'm going to talk about it. It's being hard to understand in, in just a moment. But first, I want to just say, for those of you who actually do some metaphysics and logic, there is a kind of weirdness in setting up the problem, which I'm just going to mention and then put it aside. Namely, then speaking of there being domain-specific quantifiers, um, which are more natural than the high-level, unrestricted, gentle quantifier, I'm already co courting paradox. And the reason I'm courting paradox is that absolute generality has a model theoretic kind of paradox associated with it. So someone might simply hold that every domain of quantification is restricted without thereby embracing any thesis about ways or kinds of existence. So we need to state the thesis of ontological plurals in some way acknowledging this fact. And so to say that there are these domains of quantification, which are, I mean, of the quantifier itself, which are more natural, even though there's no highest level, unrestricted general quantifier, because then we would run into these model theoretic paradoxes. But like James Studd in Oxford has written on this and others have, uh, as well. And you know, there's a whole cottage industry about stuff. And it's quite interesting and quite demanding. And, and so I'm, I'm not, I'm just gonna point out, I'm just gonna wink at it and say, however we go with ontological pluralism, 
we don't want to implicate our opponents in an immediate paradox by the state by our statement of their thesis. So we're just going to acknowledge that we need to avoid that. So we're going to waive that concern in the general view, in the general interest of getting the view on the table. All right, the view. Being is seamless. Being, insofar as it's being, doesn't admit of kinds or ways. There are kinds of beings, lots of kinds of beings. And there are ways beings are, but there are no ways of being. There are kinds of beings, but no kinds of being. There are ways beings are, but no ways of being. Further, being is binary and not scalar. Some beings are more phi than other beings, as I said a moment ago, but no beings are more than other beings, more simpliciter, that is. So being, then, is univocal. That's the university thesis, which I'll just summarize as UT. Its denial is ontological pluralism, OP. So being is the most barren and abstract of all categories, just as Hegel says, and the highest since it's the only category outside of which nothing could possibly fall. So highest entity, nothing could fall outside of it, could, it's a modal plane, could fall outside of it in the way that things fall outside of the category of being human or being red or being ornery. Okay. How to establish the view? I can't, <laughs> okay. but, but I, I'm gonna, Talk about it anyhow. Um, no, I'm gonna, I'm gonna I'm gonna give you a kind of uh, a kind of uh, argument. And one of the things that I find distressing in this, these discussions is that look, ideally, what one might like to do is argue from first principles. Say, I've got some first principles here which are intellectually true, and I'm going to deploy them, and together, corporately, jointly, they yield a valid, sound argument. The conclusion of which is the university thesis. I can't fathom what such first principles would be. Now, uh, and, it, and that's the fundamentality part that people ask people. I don't see how this could be a derived thesis from any more basic set of theses. Another way to go, you might try, and some have tried, a kind of Fragian approach. Now, this is a little bit something like what, so another, a, a co, you know, a fellow traveler with me is my old colleague, Peter Van Inwagen, and I'm going to talk about his view a little bit. Um, but. He, he, the Fragian scare quotes is that we're not really thinking about existence as a second order property or, you know, so we're just now thinking of it as a, something like a feature or a property of things, okay? And, and it, here's a thought, so that Van Inwagen has. The number 12 is univocal as applied to eggs and jurors. That's kind of a North American example because jurors come in dozens, okay? Uh, so, um, so yeah, so 12, means the same whether you apply it to eggs or to jurors. It's exactly the same. So too is by generalizing number as applied to the numbers. Now, that's a, this is a, Frege has a little worry about that, but bracket that too. But exists means counted by a number greater than zero. That's all it means. Well, that's all we have to say about it. And since the words number and counted and zero are perfectly univocal, and we know that when we have a univocal notion and it's, um, you know, it, it's non-disjunctive and what doesn't happen is that to quote Aristotle, homonymy or equivocity doesn't creep in unnoticed. If it turned out that zero was itself somehow equivocal, then our account would creep into the uh, um, definiendum, right? But that's not what's going on here because these are perfectly nipple notions. And so since, exists just means is counted by a number greater than zero, we're done. Now, I think that's a, not a, a foolish strategy. Of course, there's a whole bunch of complications for those who are new to Frege, but it's a way to start. And I don't myself think exists means that, okay? It's not an analysis of it. That's why I was saying before, but it might be a kind of consequence or a kind of explication or a kind of way of thinking about it. You might argue, I mean, this would be the gold standard if you could get it, according to me, transcendentally to the effect that uh, the universe, the university thesis is necessary for the possibility, I mean, this is a recognizably Kantian strategy for those of you who know it, for the possibility of phi, and what's phi? Well, I'll say in a moment, but since phi is actual or is presumed actual, 
P is possible because actually P entails possibly P. And so at least presumed possible. And so the university thesis, what would that be like? Well, I mean, I, I, I've toyed with various arguments of this form, but again, it's almost like arguing from first principles. But the thought is, they're essentially dialectical arguments of the form. You get someone engaged in certain kinds of contrastive ontological um, discussions. And I'll say more about this in a moment, but you know, we're, we're having a discussion about realism of universals. I'm a realist, you're a nominalist. And, but we both think particulars exist, so we're friends there. And it looks to me like what's happening here is that I'm affirming of universals what we both affirm of particulars. You're denying of universals what we both affirm of particulars. So there is something that we both affirm and I affirm of, of particulars and I affirm of universals and you, so that we can have, you deny of universals. So you might think, okay, a condition and the possibility of having that kind of ontological disagreement, which we're having, is that being is univocal. And since it's actual that we have these disagreements, they're possible. And since they're possible only if there's a predicate which embraces or being embraces these categories, being must be univocal. Now, the problem with these kinds of arguments, I mean, obviously they're not ab initio, they're not from first principles. And they also involve certain kinds of concessions made by certain interlocutors, but they might be concessions that aren't easily avoided. But there's a generality worry. I just gave you one example. And one would like an argument which said something like, for the possibility of metaphysical disagreement in general, right? Then you'd have a more potent transcendental argument, but it's a little bit difficult why we should think that the transcendental premise actually obtains. So I'm going to set that aside. One might argue that views to the contrary are positively unintelligible, leaving university as the only game in town. Now, this is the strategy by my dear friend and former colleague, Peter Van Enenweg. And that is the only one because he gives a version of the Fragian strategy too, of a certain kind, very briefly. Um, and I'll give you an example, but I mean, I don't know if people know his work or know him. He's a really quite formidable philosopher and his basic universal refutation of anything. I just sent him a paper I published on free will in the Journal of the American Philosophical Association. He kindly wrote back and said, thank you, I read the thing very carefully. It's very engaging. A lot of what you say is true, but your main thesis, I don't understand, comma, at all. Okay, now, now, now. okay, now we're friends. And, uh, but this is, but, and I, I don't take this, I, I, I don't take umbrage at this because he says this, to, and then he actually, <laughs> and I don't understand, he said, you know, I don't understand what tropes are. I don't understand what platonic, I, I, there's a long list of things he doesn't understand. And so um, that he doesn't understand it means that something like the following. Um, I don't understand it. And I don't think it's my fault because you're confused. And in fact, what you're saying is in one way or another unintelligible. And I don't really mind this form of honesty from the friend, um, but it's not really a universal philosophical reputation. And it's not really going to help here, except that I have to say, I'm just going to say, I sometimes like Van and Wagon, don't understand what my opponents are saying or trying to say. And so what I'm trying to do today is to put their view in a view in a way I can understand. And then I'm going to make a claim, okay, it's intelligible. <laughs> I don't think it's true, right? And But I'm going to set a bar above intelligibility. That's my, going to be my, insofar as I have an argument, my argument is a strategy. Oops, sorry. Can I go back? Yes. Um, oh, thank you. Yeah. yeah, good. So one might attempt, as I shall attempt, to show that views to the contrary, they're, I want to say, I don't want to say I can't understand them because they're unintelligible or whatever, um, but rather they're somehow permanently unmoored. That's going to be my strategy. I'm going to say that they're not in any proper sense of the term metaphysically articulable. So that's going to, what's that mean? Well, it's going to be a some kind of threshold above intelligibility, which you've got to get above in order for your view to be taken seriously. And I'm going to claim, so far as I can see, I can't, shove this view, ontological pluralism, above this threshold. Okay, so here's Peter Van Wagen's gambit, typical sort of claim from him. 
not everything and absolutely unrestricted everything is a non-unicorn, the Meinongian says. And yet unicorns are nowhere to be found. More precisely, they're not found to be, they are not to be found in certain places, but I cannot visit these places because they do not exist. Unicorns are nowhere to be found because they lack being. They have subsistence of some kind. But when the Meinongians say this, I must protest that either he contradicts himself or I do not understand him. Okay, either they say they're somewhere, but they do not exist, or they they have subsistence, but not they have existence, but not, but they aren't, or something like so it says, but or I just don't understand what they're saying. Well, they have a view, obviously, Minongians. And Minong himself, of course, as you know, if you study Minong, went very carefully toward what we call Minongianism. This was not something he began his career with. It was something that he felt compelled to in order to account for various kinds of data. What I'm going to say is not that it's unintelligible, I can't understand it. I'm going to say that if it's true, it must be metaphysically articulable. And what I mean by that is that it must be able to be articulated within a metaphysical framework. And I'm going to offer a metaphysical framework in the form of two taxonomical frameworks which would suit to establish it. Okay, so insofar as I have an argument, here it is. It's going to be a, 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 mar, a modest argumentative template. If ontological pluralism is true, then there's some taxonomical scheme or other in terms of which it can be articulated. That's what I mean by metaphysically articulated. The only two taxonomical schemes Fit for purpose are a broadly Aristotelian category theory or some version of a determinable determinate hierarchy. Any attempt to articulate this thesis in a broadly Aristotelian in terms collapses into a taxonomy, not of being, but of beings. No taxonomy of beings is sufficient for a taxonomy of being, so no broadly Aristotelian taxonomy is available for ontological pluralism. So, if 2A, i.e. the broadly asterisk, is true, then not ontological pluralism, but since this is a mutually exclusive and exhaustive distinction, the university thesis. Any attempt to articulate it in the determinable determinant framework is subject to a problem of constraint. And this, this is, I think, by the way, I'll just say a little less obvious. If that's so, then the framework of the determinable determinant uh, framework is unavailable for ontological pluralism. And so again, by the same argument, UT, either 2A or 2B, so the university thesis. So that's my that's going to be the rest of my talk. I'm going to say there are two category frameworks or two taxonomical frameworks. You're telling me there are ways of being or kinds of being. And I say, so you're telling me that they are subject to some taxonomical framework in which they must be articulated. If you deny that, then I'm going to stop talking and go Peter Van Inwagen on you and say, I, 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 when, I, you, when you talk about kinds and you talk about ways, you're talking about a con an essentially contrastive notion. You're talking about one kind among others or some way among others. And so I'm gonna offer you two. So here's a, here's a tiny taste. And some of you who were in this room a week or two ago saw a little taste of this in Neoplatonism. So here's, here's a kind of thing you get from some versions of Aristotelians, maybe from Aristotle himself, not on, the, not on being, but on the good. It goes something like this. So we ha I have a category theory. I have substances and quantities and qualities and various, and then there's a delimited number of them. Let's say there are 10. Everything which exists is in one of these categories or some kind of concatenation built up out of the things in the categories. And um, then we say, and then there are these predicates. And Aristotle will say things like, if is or exists were a univocal predicate, if, it, if we suppose that, then it could not be predicated in all the categories, but rather in one only. Yet it is predicated in all the categories. Every category, you say, it is, it is, it is, it exists, it exists, it exists, qualities exist, quantities exist, and so on. And so now, it's not univocal. If you're like me, you ought to think that's, first of all, does that ring like an Aristotelian argument to you? It seems like a very peculiar argument in a lot of ways. It seems to me a bad argument. And uh, it, by the way, it's not an argument Aristotle gives, but others give it on his behalf. He does give a kind of argument like that about goodness. Um, some observations about that little argument. Well, I don't get why if is or exists is predicated in all the categories. I mean, it does seem to be then if it's affirmative entities in those categories, what is denying to say platonic forms, then presumably the predicate must be univocal. 
there's Plato saying there's this other category of being, it's called a platonic form, which is like a, your substance except exists separately, independently, and abstractly as a paradigmatic entity. Aristotle said that's empty language. So he's denying the existence of those things. There's no category for those things. They don't exist. And so it looks to me like <laughs> it's precisely that they must be univocal. He's, he's offering to his categories things that he's denying to platonic forms. Else there's simply no disagreement. This is the thing I alluded to a little bit earlier, saying that there was a kind of, this like has a, a whiff of the transcendental strategy. But why suppose two? What was two? That if is or exists could not be predicated in all the categories, but it would be, if it were, you know, if it were non univocal, it couldn't be predicated, it would be predicated, if it were univocal, be predicated in one category only, so instead of backwards. But there seems to be some manner of intracategorial meaning restriction in play here. But as far as I can see, it's impossible or at least difficult to defend. Or it seems to me, if I've understood it correctly, plainly false. Consider the predicate has weight. Substances have weight. Socrates is a substance, he has weight. Some quantities have weight, namely <laughs> the quantities which measure, which measure volumes. Um, some relatives have weight. In, in this schema, we, we, for those of you who don't know, Aristotle talks not about relations, i.e. dyadic relations, the properties which obtain between uh, two arguments, but rather relatives, things like slaves and masters, so things which stand in certain kinds of specifiable relations to one another. But slaves have weight, so they're in the category of relative, and they have weight. So as far as I can see, he's saying, not only is it possible, it must be the case that this phrase has weight is a predicate which is transcategorial, not only possibly applied beyond one category, but necessarily applied beyond one category. And so we would have to infer that it has weight is also non-univocal, but that seems to me patently indefensible. Same again, for it can be qualified, would not exist where there are no substances and so on. So let's now step back from Aristotle's the Aristotelian kind of thing. So I remember I said, is the thesis that being is, it might be true if it's definable in more than one way. Well, so let's grant that being is indefinable. It's definitely to fit the genus proximum differentium specificium. So the, here the idea is that, how do we, do, so how do you give definitions in this taxonomical framework? Well, we put things in a genus, in the closest genus, and then we appeal to a differentia. That would show that being is not a genus, Aristotle's famous slogan, only if necessarily every genus were definable. Because of course you might say being isn't definable, but you don't know it's not a genus until you know that genera, um, that every genus is definable. And then supposing even then, that this would show that being is non-univocal only if gamma is univocal, only if gamma is a genus. But of course that looks false because there are lots of entities which are perfectly univocal which are not genera, like the predicate being read, <laughs> as far as I can see. The most this could show is that being is, if a genus, the highest genus. Again, that genus outside of which nothing would fall. But that doesn't take me anywhere near the non-university of genus, non-university of being, so it doesn't take me anywhere near ontological pluralism. All right, now, <laughs> There's an attempt in some people's minds to kind of turn the tables. You might turn the table thus. In the Aristotelian, so I'm still, so I'm gonna go through two taxonomies, the broadly Aristotelian taxonomy and the second taxonomy given in terms of determinants and determinables. And that'll be shorter. I'm doing here, be good. You might think, look, in this framework, there are kinds of being, species of being, only if there's a genus of being and its very species have statable differentiae in terms of which those species are at least extensionally marked off from one another. That's what the, that's how the, the thing goes. If there are species of being, then there is a genus of being after all. For goodness sakes, that's because <laughs> that's what the account of definition in this framework requires. Thus, as every genus is univocal, that's being would after all be univocal. But I think this attempted peritrope settles nothing, however, it mainly postpones and refocuses our question, what are the species themselves meant to be, where 
species one, species two, species three are all species of not beings, but of being. And that's still an open question. To answer that there are things like abstract or concrete being differentiated by those very differentiated. So I have some beings, some abstract ones, and some concrete ones, and then the ways of being, and the ways of being, in addition to the beings themselves, are themselves differentiated, or the some kinds of beings, the kinds of being are differentiated by those very properties themselves, being abstractly, being concretely, something like that. It seems right, only right and proper to respond, as far as I can see, that seems to move us to the domain of beings rather than being, i.e., they exist because they have to differentiate those beings of being abstract. <laughs> That's what makes them abstract beings. But here's the more important point for my purposes. It seemed to catapult us really into a competing taxonomy. Which taxonomy is that? Our second taxonomy. So those, that's what I have to say about kinds of being. And I want to say something about ways of being. These are often used somehow interchangeably, which is, to my mind, worrisome. Ways of being. Perhaps you say, not types or species or kinds of being, or as I would prefer beings, like abstract or concrete being or beings, but rather ways of being, being abstractly or being concretely. I just want to say to my opponents, I kind of get what you're saying. <laughs> I understand the idea that I mean, just, you might think there's these different ways of existing. Existing abstractly is not the same way of existing. I, I, I can almost get on side a little bit if I'm trying, and I, I want to be generous. I don't want to like sort of be, I mean, the, this is the worry about the Peter Van Inwagen strategy. It's preemptive, right? So like, you're befuddled and nice chap, but no good. Now, um, so this commends a different sort of taxonomy, as far as I can see, not even vaguely Aristotelian, although, of course, some Aristotelians have tried to foist it on Aristotle, namely the determinable determinant taxonomy. Where does this come from? What is it? It seems, as far as I can see, it's derived ultimately from W. Johnson's logic of 1921. He's the first person to introduce this taxonomy clearly and forcefully. There are some, of course, historical antecedents of various kinds which one can recapture. He says this. So this is he's what he's trying to do is to give an account of a taxonomy which is non-Aristotelian. He thinks that not all taxonomies are, in fact, Aristotelian, and he's right about that. I propose to call such terms as color and shape determinables in relation to such terms as red and circular, which we will call determinates. And in introducing this new terminology, to examine the distinction between the relation of red to color and the relation of Plato to man. Notice that he's back at the level of the individual man rather than the species. So he's saying, yeah, what is the relation between, Plato's not differentiated from all the other human beings by some differentia. He's got some other relations to the species. And the claim is, it's a way of being, it's a way of being, it's a determinate human being. On this way of thinking, being abstractly or being concretely are ways of being, as red and blue are ways of being a color. You can see that this is a different taxonomy if you attend to the following simple observation. The difference between this taxonomy and the Aristotelian, blue and red are not differentiated by appeal to differentiae. The other great person who worked on this distinction was Arthur Pryor. To say that a human rational, uh, uh, that, that, a ra that a human is a rational animal is to differentiate human beings from other animals by appeal to this differentia, namely being rational. And that's supposed to carve out extensionally the human beings from all the other animals. But of course, they're all generically animals. To say that red is a red color and not a blue color, one can evidently point only to the color itself. Red is, well, how, what kind of color is red? What kind of animal is a human being, a rational one? What kind of color is red? So it's, it's the red kind. <laughs> the, 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 there's, so there's no further differentia to differentiate colors from one another. And so it's a way of being a color. And then you might think, and you might think of Aristotle's hierarchy too, nothing is just an animal. Everything is a determinant animal. Nothing's just a color. It's a determinant color. But notice here now we have these ways of being a color and it's merely a precisification or a rendering of determinant, a higher order determinable, and not something which is differentiated by means of some differentia. So Pryor, Arthur Pryor says, he has two articles, I think from 49, which you have a good interest in this. They're really worth reading. They're the best things out there, I'd say. Oh, yeah. Um, we can say that red 
that the red and the blue agree in being colored, but of their difference, we can say only either that their color is different, okay, or that one is red and the other is blue. So nothing further to be said about this taxonomy. So more fully, in my lingo now, to say that one way of being B1 is, super, is uh, subordinate to a superordinate, and now people speak of, you know, like Chris McDaniel, thinner, <coughs> thinner notion, um, way of being is to say B2, is to say among other things, that B2 is determinable of B1 such that, now this is a necessary condition, necessarily, phi determines C only if necessarily for all X, if X has phi, then X has C, and possibly for some X, X has C, but not phi. So blue determines color just in case anything which is blue is a color, but possibly there is a color which isn't blue. And that second point is needed in order, and this captures what I was saying was this, what I'm assisting on, some contrastive notion for the thesis that there are ways of being. Without that, I'm no longer in the game of discussion, discussing. C1 under C is not differentiated from, um, so B2 by means of a differential delta. Now though, with only that much of a relation specified, and here I just say, I mean, there's a lot of texture here, but ways of being threatened to become ungovernably many. As far as I can see, there are as many as there are adverbs to be deployed. Now, you need some filter, as far as I can see. You might think that without an independent constraint, the naturalness of some, uh, naturalness of some form, the endlessly thicker accounts of being march on and on. Here are the ways you might be. You might be malely or femalely or coupledly or waterly or handily. And each one of those, now you might say, well, we're going to sift those, the natural ones, but they must be natural ways of being. <laughs> okay. Because otherwise, then we have natural beings. We're back on the perfectly acceptable thought that there are many kinds of beings, some more natural than others. Colors by contrast, for example, are constrained by the simple fact that given these terms, nothing that is not a color is a determinant of color. So color comes with a built-in limit, namely because to be under it, you've got to be a determinable of a color. But of course, everything is a being. How are we doing? Good, I'm just about there. A worry then. These easy ways of being seem easy only because they are they surreptitiously appeal to univocal notion all along. Nothing exists ex abstractly, but only concretely. That's what people will say. I mean, there's, there, there, first gloss: the determinant being abstractly falling under the determinable being has nothing in its extension, unlike the determinant being concretely. That obvious thought that the author seeks. So to, to do so without, sorry, to do without from abstract entities, what she's content to offer to, she wants to withhold from, I should say, I should say withhold from, uh, to concrete entities. Excuse me, yeah, that's, yeah th this obviously thought that the author seeks to withhold from abstract entities what she is content to offer to concrete entities. Second gloss, mine. There are no abstract beings, only concrete beings. I, I think that's false because I think they're abstract entities, but perfectly intelligible thing to say. Just so, say I. Where does this leave us? This is my coda, and then I'll stop. What about scalarity? This is the other big rejection. And this is where I think people, are, I'm, 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 this I do become flummoxed in the Peter Van Inwagen way. I don't really know why my, author, my, why my opponents say both of these things. Scalarity. According to the scalarity being, the scalarity of being the following we saw is a syntactically and semantically complete, even true sentence. X is more than Y. Let it be so. So try to like try to think of being or existence like the chroma value of a color. For those of you who know art, you know shades of colors, and there, but there's also chroma value. This the, the, the something like the I mean painters play with this, but something like the intensity of saturation of a color. 
at a certain at a, at a certain tone, at a certain pitch, at, you know, in music, but in in colors, you know, at, at, a, at a, just basically you can have one the same shade and have it more deeply or intensely saturated. So think of being like that, kind of shimmering a little bit there somehow. Okay, so let it be so. If it is so, however, then since x and y are ordinally rank plus phi, only if phi is univocal across the application to x and y, then being a scalar only if it's not equivocal. That's to say, you can't say that x is bluer than y if you're using blue to mean, as it is in English, like depressed. You say, oh, Mondrian's blue nude is bluer than Camus. Well, okay, there's a, you can speak metaphorically in that way if you want, but there's not an ordinal there's not an ordinal ranking of blue things in such a claim. So being a scalar only if it's univocal. So we may conclude then, you might want one thesis, this scalarity over ontological pluralism, or you might try for another ontological pluralism over scalarity. Neither is advised, but both are by me, but both are at once, both at once positively prescribed because you end up with a contradiction. So all in, last slide. Taking the thesis of the non-university of being um, would seem in some metaphysically, taken in some metaphysically articulable way would seem in the first instance to implicate us in some manner of taxonomical framework. That was my first suggestion. Two, the available taxonomical schemes fail to vouchsafe any such articulable, and now, I'm wondering intelligible, maybe, but I'm not pushing that far. I'm saying articulable in this taxonomical framework, thesis. Hence, all in, we would do well to default to the simple, attractively guilt-free thought that being is seamless. Thank you. Um,